talked to lots of people who come here looking for the Silicon Valley experience. They arrive with one suitcase in hand when they head south on the 101, hoping to see it, this place they've heard about. And it's freeways, and it's office parks, and it's strip malls, and it looks like every place they've ever been. They end up wondering, where have they come? Why did they come here? What was it that brought them? Code itself is the underlying thing that makes computers work. Why is it important to the world? It's because it's the blood of the organism that's our culture now. It's, it, it, it makes everything go. You know, technology has become the god of our society now. I mean, I think that people stand in awe of it and, the, and stand in awe of the people that make it. There's a sense that software is a kind of new frontier. You know, it's the old gold rush metaphor, the California gold rush all over again. It's the kind of Hollywood of the 20s. This very small set of people is really defining what our world's going to be like. I mean, it, you know, the computer becoming ubiquitous and the way we interact with the world more and more mediated through the computer is this very small group of people defining what that world's going to be like. Less than three years ago, a small team of engineers at Netscape Communications created software that made surfing the internet easy and in the process changed the face of computing. On this day, however, the company is in big trouble, driven to the ground by its rival and software colossus, Microsoft. Only a radical strategy will help save it. Let's hear a little Mozilla! 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 Netscape is giving away its source code to programmers outside the company. The source code is the secret formula for browsing the web. The code is named Mozilla, and if widely adapted, it will make Netscape's code the internet standard, drawing users to its other products and restoring the company's sagging fortunes. Our story focuses on a team of engineers who will come together in this building. Over the course of the next year, they will turn their lives inside out to create Mozilla and battle a giant competitor to save their company and shape the future of computing. Right now we have a problem that the work looks like it can't possibly be done for the date we announced. So we're just trying to drill down on how doomed we are. And Sometimes the only way to do that is to get everybody in a room and stare each other in the eyes. We said we're giving you Netscape Communicator on 331. So if we're not giving them Netscape Communicator on 331, we need a way we, to address that. We can't do anything that. about it right now, and we're working to rectify The goal is to get Mozilla to developers by March 31st, a few short weeks from now. It is one of the most ambitious schedules in the company's history. It's a joke. I think we've been very explicit about it. Okay, when you make a mistake, uh, correct it as soon as you can. That's all you can do. We've now, we've now timed out okay. on my imaginary a lot of time. <laughs> Michael Toy, one of Netscape's first employees, heads the team that will prepare Mozilla for public release. We're probably doomed. We're probably going to fail. Microsoft is probably going to squish us like a bug anyway, but just because we're doomed, it doesn't mean you know we can't get up in the morning and, and do work. All rise. <laughs> Honorable Michael Toy presiding. Honorable. I mean, I'm pretty flip with my kids about what I do. You know, what do you do at work? At oh, I don't know. I, I sit in meetings and I feel depressed and I read email. Oh, oh, you got me. Oh. Well, they think my office is the greatest place in the world, though. It's like, oh, we going to your office? Oh, yay, yippee! I love going to your office because they, you know, they play with the guns and there's free soda and there's the giant balls. Basically, I work at Disneyland as far as they're concerned. I talk about marathon versus sprint. The hard part is to run with significant intensity the whole way, knowing that if you ever start, wa start walking, you're not going to make it. And just keep the end in sight and know that there's this urgency. Jim Ruskind, an expert on software security, is brought in to enforce rigorous standards of engineering precision. Imagine if you had a project where you felt doom was imminent, all the different players wondering, 
Are they pushed beyond their level? Can they think of a way of running faster? Can anyone help them? So there's a lot of tension and anxiety over making the schedule. Jamie Zawinski, free source code evangelist, will enlist outside developers to Netscape's cause. The free source thing is, is trying to change the rules, right? There are people who have the free software religion. The one thing they have in common is they're all hackers. You know, they all you know, like writing code. So hoping to tap into all of those smart people and, and get something from it, you know, so that everyone benefits. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't know. We're talking about two million, two and a half million lines of code, and every one of them has to be gone over carefully, and in some cases, twice. Okay, I think we're ready. With hundreds of engineers converging on Mozilla, with new code to enable its release, Tara Hernandez makes sure that their changes do not crash Mozilla and bring everyone's work to a halt. This is how we keep track of all the changes that are going in. Uh, green is good. A lot of changes going in right here, and wham, the builds all died. Okay? All right. Bye. No, 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 no. no, no. Some of the worst crashes are reserved for Scott Collins, a veteran code writer who stands by for late night troubleshooting. I've been here for about, uh, I don't know, 60 hours or so. Writing software is different from um, selling real estate. Selling real estate, you sell to people, the people are asleep at night. When they go to sleep, you have to stop selling real estate. Computers never sleep. <laughs> You can see my cube is decked out a little bit better than other people's. I have a nice couch, little mattress on under there I can sleep in, artwork for my children. I have control of the light switches. This is what I'd like to get if my wife truly loved me. She'd let me have one. Life is good. Okay. Okay. All right, um, there are a ton of bugs in here that people just aren't doing anything about. Instance, to give away its code, Netscape's engineers must make thousands of bug fixes, often minute changes that will allow the code to be used by outside developers. Jeff Weinstein has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. One bug hidden in the mass of code can stop everyone else's work and threaten the ship date. I need someone to pay Jeff Weinstein and get him to call uh, 2024. Even a team of 20 people building a car, it's easy to step back 40 feet and look and go, hold it, that guy's not putting on the wheel. You have 40 yeah, programmers working, they all come to you with code, a gigantic morass of little details piled up on a disk. Usually you can't even see the pieces, whether they were doing it correctly. You have to assemble it into the hole and then see if the hole works, and then you're not even sure who gave you the bad bits. That would be bad. Let's go downstairs. Come on. You know, you, you talk about a recipe. Who yeah, gave you the bad flour? Someone went out to grind flour, and they had to all be exactly the right size so chunks of flour. Someone else made too. chocolate chips. They all had to be the right size chunks. You can't figure it out until you put it all together. You hand it out, and people go, I don't like the way this tastes. Okay. And now you have to wonder, with all these details coming together, which was the problem? Who's causing the problem? How can you fix it? You've got to ship on a certain time. And now you have all these people, you have the clock ticking, it gets pretty intense. Since Netscape began, the amount of code making up Mozilla has increased by a factor of 30. The job of programming and debugging it rests upon a precarious balance of science and art. What does it say right now? They uh, talk about what they do as if it was a kind of alchemy, a kind of wizardry. It does remind me of athletics in that way. You know, why is someone a good baseball hitter? Often the, the hitters themselves can't really explain it. And often the best software people cannot themselves understand why they're so good at it. But I think what makes a great programmer is being raised techie. My particular team at Netscape, I think we all grew up techie. We all grew up with, with computers around us somewhere so that we were exposed to them before we became adults, if any of us are really adults. Jim's the most grown up of us. A lot of my childhood from roughly age 6 to age 17 was around here. Life was just a nightmare. This was a very, very scary place. The two school wasn't too bad, uh, but it meant that you get to work on puzzles and problems. 
All of the puzzling is math, and that puzzling is the exact same feeling, the exact same problem that you go through when you're programming. When I was young, I'd be building with Erector sets and Lego. Now, the structures that you build are in software. My mom is a first-class geek, too. And so I have a, the unique experience of being able to talk shop with my mom, because she's a director of really important stuff at Sun. And Netscape, one of the code words for is the average person going to be able to use the software is, well, can my mom use it? It's like, well, yeah, my mom can use it. My mom can write optimizing compilers. By the time I was 12 years old, I was making 50 bucks an hour programming computers. People say, what should, what should I be? Should I, should I grow up to be a, uh, you know, well, I say computer programmer. The thing about that makes it a youth culture is one's capacity to throw one's entire life on the line with these firms. Entire life commitment, meaning 24, 7, 365 work commitment. Ah. Throwing yourself into a thing where you don't know if that job is going to be around soon. There's no stability here. So it's very kind of a weird um, irony that the very people who are inventing the future can't see their own future. This is a monk-like existence. There are very few women in these societies. These are male societies. They are secret societies. They function very much like the Masons or some street gang. Evil! 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 Now you're evil and stupid. <laughs> you know what, I'm actually just in a different time zone. Right? I thought stupidity was an excuse, though. A lot of people at Netscape don't get out much because they're at work all the time, but most people's social interaction, I would expect, is, is revolves around work just because so many people spend so much of their time at work. Hey, Chris, it's Tara. Yeah, I mean, um, how much do you love me? Good. What do you know about, like, writing stuff that falls into JavaScript and Java and XFB? Gordon been talking to you? All we have left to hold on to really is the workplace. I mean, it is the modern village. People get to know your history. They shrug at your bad jokes. There's a kind of familiarity that, uh, and continuity that we don't have elsewhere. Paul, we're going to go out in a while and get something to eat and uh, do stupid things. You interested? Sure. Sure. Right. OK, purpose of this meeting is not to beat up people. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to make sure that, as a company, we are incredibly focused on getting the bug count to zero. Uh, we've been moderately focused up until now. We need to be deadly focused from here on in. Okay, uh, <laughs> Jeff Weinstein. Is he in this room? He is not in this room. He is not in this room. Did not check in this weekend. He did not answer his mail, and he hasn't answered his phone yet either. His locator shows he's with the rest of the colonists. <laughs> the old saying is that trying to manage programmers is like trying to herd cats. You know, you, you want them to be cats, I mean, if you like cats, I mean, because you want what's unique about that creature, but they really don't all like to go in the same direction. Where the hell does Weinstein sit, actually? In less than four years, Netscape has grown from a handful of people to over 2,000. And sometimes, locating a programmer becomes yet another obstacle for the browser team to overcome. I'd say he's not in there. That would be my guess, straight out. He's not there. When's the last time he was in here? This afternoon. Oh. Okay. So, Tara and I are ready to take a hit out on him. Okay. Well, if you see when he comes back, tell him to panic and run around. And, yeah. and we're, like, doomed on Mac right now. Doomed! They, the person who's working on Mac is, like, waiting well, for data, right? You should go around She's and get, like, every person nine. in the company saying, doomed! Netscape's predicament has much to do with this man, Bill Gates, whose company, Microsoft, has made him the richest and arguably the most powerful man in the world. All right, if we could have order, we'd like to begin. Viewing Netscape's browser as a potential threat to his computing empire, Gates has moved swiftly, making his own browser free, and Netscape claims also engaging in unfair business practices to take away its customers. But we need to explore today whether you and your company have crossed the line. Or, on the other hand, 
whether this is just the carping of disgruntled rivals. Netscape CEO Jim Barksdale argues his company's case before the Senate. And certainly nobody here on this panel is a greater admirer of Mr. Gates or his company than I am. But we do ask that Microsoft be held accountable for some of their actions, actions that intimidate PCOEM manufacturers to use their products and exclusionary practices that prevent them from using my products. Not all companies succeed. Some fail to embrace change. This is the way technology in the free market works. The software industry's success has not been driven by government regulation, but by freedom and the basic human desire to learn, to innovate, and to excel. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, Netscape programmers continue working around the clock in a race to meet Mozilla's release date. These guys, they tend to work very consistently, so they'll just keep working until it's done. They won't stop. They don't need food. They don't need sleep. They don't need anything. Okay, they can say take pay, but... You know, that's <laughs> a while ago, some people from Harvard came and said, well, how do you develop software? We're writing a book. And I talked about all the things that I thought were really important, and they were just... It felt to me like they were shaking their heads going... Oh, gee, he doesn't know about principle 7, and oh, he doesn't know about principle 22. And in some ways, they're right. You're like, I really haven't got a clue, right? I really like to err on the side of every day we wake up in the morning and say, based on what I know today, what's the best way to get to, to where, I, where we all want to go? I personally, or me and you three of us, do not have time to read all two million lines of source code to see that there are no remaining problems. We're going over here. Zeroing in on their fine time. With March 31st only days away, the team can't proceed until Jeff Weinstein, an expert on some of Netscape's most arcane code, finds time to complete the bug fixes on his list. How are you doing? Okay. All right. Well, you're officially the most doomed individual in the company, yeah. sir. Uh, this one I can close. Same with this one. Yeah, a bunch of these. Hopefully, I'll get most of it done tonight. His goal, he was just going to stay all night, and he was going to get it all done. The good news is actually, I think by about, I'm not sure if it was 9 or 11 o'clock at night, he actually was completely done. Reaching a critical milestone is cause for celebration. <laughs> I have one bug left. And that's a really, really hard one, but I'm working on it. Don't make me kill you. Close before 3.30. I will close it before 3.30. It'll be good. The bug count is small. There are some bugs that are not currently closed, but most of them are like totally little annoying things that... Nope. Some of it's stuck! Yeah. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! I'll praise the mighty ones. There's just been a tremendous pile of people working really hard this week to do the impossible. There's this magic phrase that Michael Toy invented, which is Zorro Boogs, um, which is, it's not quite perfect, but it's perfect enough. You know, zero bugs, Zorro Boogs. We got a spare monitor upstairs on the Pink's Cube, right? Uh, yes, I do have a spare monitor. This is the first big test. Will an outsider actually be able to make Mozilla work? If not, Netscape stands a good chance of missing its March 31st deadline. I thought this was going to be a huge thing. I thought it was going to be like 100, 200 people here, like all in rows, like with Soviet uh, style. Yeah. <laughs> Compiling. Uh, we're nowhere there. near that organized. All right. Looks like it's all there. Here we go. Yeah. Wow. All good. It's pretty simple how stuff's built. It's just there's a set of scripts that are set up to say exactly what to compile and then they all get globbed together into Mozilla, hopefully. <laughs> Here it is. Yeah. If, if you get it to work, then it means anybody can get it to work. That's true. actually get somebody to build this quickly. And we had to do one small adjustment, and it worked. With the source almost ready to ship, Netscape must explain the significance of Mozilla to the press. Basically, what we want to do is we want to give them a little bit of the history, 
and then we want to go into what's actually going to happen tomorrow. The other important takeaway then too from this is that this is a really exciting, cool thing. Hi, Stan Dolberg and uh, Eric Brown, please. One second. Avery voicemail for Stan Dolberg. I'll transfer you now. Good afternoon, Forrester. Hi, this is Maggie Young calling from Netscape, and I have a scheduled conference call with Stan Dolberg and Eric Brown, and I just got Stan's voicemail. Netscape hopes the press will greet Mozilla with the same enthusiasm it had for the company in its early days. At 11 a.m. this morning, Netscape stock went public and Wall Street went bonkers. Initially offered at a price of $28 a share, Netscape shot up to 72 within minutes. The stock is bid up at extraordinary levels in the first couple of really days and weeks of its introduction. It is the biggest initial public offering in basically Wall Street history. Good afternoon, Forrester. Today, less than three years after its record-breaking IPO, however, Netscape's story generates a different response. Are you there? Yeah. Um, as you know, tomorrow is March 31st. Yep. So that means um, source code will be made available to the developer community, and we thought we would just um, catch you up to speed and walk you through that and see if you had some questions. Either I'm brain dead or it takes a lot of effort to communicate, and so I'm concerned that while you all know what it means, I'm, I'm not confident that it's coming across to the press. Right, I think those are good points. By opening up the source code, we basically extend our developer community from those folks that are inside of Netscape to hundreds of thousands of developers outside of Netscape. Yep. So you, it's no longer Netscape versus Microsoft, it's Netscape and all of the Netscape you know, virtual community. I think there is a belief that Netscape doesn't have a position to continue to compete with Microsoft in the browser front, and that, in essence, you've given up on the browser position. This was a lot more smooth than I had originally anticipated, really. Uh, I'm still waiting for the major bump in the road that's going to happen sometime between now and tomorrow afternoon. In software development, there's always a bump in the road. We just want to hear the Apple story. I'm sure you do. They just can't quite get themselves comfortable with the patent grant or with whatever we tried to do to fix it for them. What patent? So the last thing back out of their lawyer was, gee, I don't know that we get enough protection. Mozilla has a small piece of code from Apple that has not been cleared for public license. Okay. We have to escalate. Hi, this is Mark Andreessen. Um, I called a few minutes ago. I called my wife. And uh, I left a message. Um, I w we're trying to get, the problem is I can't get phone, the, there's no one at the Apple switchboard, so I'm having a hard time getting phone numbers for people. Awesome. You checked it in. You checked it in? Uh, yeah. What was it? Hold on. 620. Uh, uh, In order to ship Mozilla the next morning, Scott Collins is called in to replace Apple's code with his own invention. And theoretically, we believe this is possible. It's my last bug. When I complete this bug, I will be allowed to rest. So I stayed up until about 5.40 uh, this morning writing this replacement class because it made my life a living hell. I got it basically running. It's all running. It's all really good. And thank heavens, uh, we got permission from Apple to ship the regular source. It's my understanding that Jamie is going to be the person that it's going to be pushing the bits up to the website at around 10 o'clock. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And we're going to be staging some different photo opportunities for the press at that time. There will be television cameras. You know, we just like hire actors to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was just telling you to be on TV. Come on. We're not going to... Man, they're on TV now. They're on TV for three months. I personally don't think anyone is going to come. One way to learn to run a marathon is put a person out 26 miles into the desert and say, you know, that there's this bomb on your back that's going to go off in a certain length of time if you don't get into the town. Well, that'll motivate you to get in, but there's a certain chance that you'll be blown up. Can you this? Yeah, it's uh, 5 to 10. Ah! So. We're going to be late. Hurry up. 
and welcome everybody to the conference call. Thanks for joining us this morning. Today, uh, Netscape announced that the first developer release of its Communicator 5.0 source code is available for download from the Mo Mozilla.org website. And you know where Tar is. That's right. It's the second floor? Yeah, it's or the first floor, um, like way on the other side. And then today, on the end of March, as we announced, we are pushing the code out to the web, as they say, and we're delighted to be part of it, and we're very excited to see what happens. The good news is the marathoner is now coming into town with that bomb on his back, and it looks like he's going to make it. This is the moment of truth. They don't have a theoretical framework to write software. They're just writing it. Hi. It's just like hitting the baseball. If their code gets a home run, nobody's asking questions. Well, this doesn't make sense, or why do you do that? Why does it work? Nobody cares why it works. Yeah, nursing. This is bad. What's that? Um, well, it's not connected to the... The, uh, the machine that, that controls the FTP push is, like, not answering. Is it loaded? It's, it's blast, uh, not uh, blash. Oh. So, yeah, maybe yeah, it would not to... Uh, mm -hmm. Oh. That bin, yeah. Duh. Duh. Okay. We're okay. up. Yay. It's soup. Max there. Phoenix is there. Windows is there. <laughs> We're done. We're done. done. It's up. We're done. <laughs> here, I'm told that means that we have now pushed the source out on the net. Is that correct? Yeah. Actually, yeah. we decided not to. <laughs> Any fun? It, it, it was just a stupid idea. <laughs> That's our story and we're sticking to it. For a moment, everyone at Netscape takes a breather. I think it's going to work out. In the first hours of its release, the source code is downloaded thousands of times. But the number of downloads is no guarantee that Netscape will receive enough valuable contributions to help the company reverse its slide. He's known as Pavlov to me. He's Pavlov at Pavlov.net. On IRC, he's Pavlov or Pav or... Um, Pav sleeping or Pav tired up too late and um, without him I think we'd be you know months behind. Netscape's notoriety draws code writers from around the world willing to work on Mozilla without pay. One such contributor comes from rural Georgia. I have been amazed over the last two or three years when especially his mother would come tell me well so-and-so called from uh, maybe New York or, and they were coming to Atlanta and they wanted to talk to Stewart or see him and they were going to go down and have lunch. Well, I'd say, you know, who is this person from New York? And, and then all of a sudden, well, he's been working with Stewart on uh, some programming issues for uh, a year or so, and he wanted to come down and meet. He said, well, did you tell him you're only uh, 16? I, I had no idea. Um, and that's great. That's a, that's a wonderful thing, because he's, he's contributing. He's, it doesn't matter that he's young. We're in the place we call the cave. We just shut the door, um, and this is where he does whatever he does. It is flabbergasting to think that your child has done something for this worldwide company um, instead of his homework. I went and looked back at the old, the older code and I, I was really frightened by how me incredibly messy and just awful the code looked. It would have taken you, you, you know, years to try and figure out what it was doing. So we basically did it from scratch Pretty much, I'm providing the code that makes the browser show everything faster and uh, more efficiently than it used to. His keyboarding is almost just like talking. It's just um, an expression. Uh, he can express himself that way, and it's, it's just totally uh, unconscious almost, um, just a part of how he communicates. In the past, free code contributions helped build the Internet. How a commercial enterprise will benefit from free code remains a big question. Well, it's certainly my hope that the enormous amount of, of, of new people that no one company could afford to have working on any product 
uh, now contributing to the Netscape Navigator Communicator will make a significant difference in the improvement of the product. Uh, how that works against any competitor uh, remains to be seen. Morning. Morning. David Retterman, an analyst for a San Francisco investment bank, closely monitors Netscape's radical plan for investors eager to participate in the Internet stock boom. The, the market is really kind of a voting machine. It's voting, yes, I believe that vision statement. Yes, I believe that's going to result in product sales. Yes, that's going to drive earnings up, and, and you know, stocks should trade accordingly. The financial benefits to Netscape of giving away its source code are hard to measure. I understand why Netscape's trying to do it, but I think they still have to show me um, that um, behind the vision and the slideware, um, there's a real uh, sustainable business model that can deliver earnings, um, and, uh, and so I'm in a show me mode for Netscape. Now, my job will be three times as hard as it was yesterday. It was already ten times harder than it needed to be, right? <laughs> Did I just work really hard to ship the company jewels out of the building, and it's just going to just end us in this dying and yeah. rolling in poison and misery? The day after the stuff goes out, you really don't get a let up. There is then this sort of day in, day out, go to work, turn on the computer, code, code, code. That's Tara. Uh -huh. mm. uh -huh. Tara. Yeah, what's your doctor say, Tara? Uh, my doctor says, uh, interestingly enough, that I work too much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that if I went to work today after my appointment, he would personally kill me. I have a, uh, an agreement with myself that by the time I'm 35, I'm either going to be a high school teacher or a bartender, but something, anything other than a, a position in the high-tech industry. Otherwise, I'll probably die by the time I'm 40. Now that I'm an old guy, I've kind of been around the block a couple times, and you can go from realizing this just never stops, does it? And that being really depressing because you feel like I'm on, I'm on, I said I was never going to be on the treadmill, and here I am. I'm on the treadmill, I'm going to be running like this forever. Because they're good at software, they need to keep pace, and as a result, keeping pace means to shut a lot of other things out. They just don't have time to read, time to hear about the world. They don't have much time for their families. But when you're in a situation where you really have a lot of work to do and no time to do it, you know, you, you pick what you want. Some people pick wanting to have a family. Some people pick wanting to get some software done. Christopher was born right after I started at Netscape. And uh, I basically missed the first two years of his life because of the intensity I'd work till about 7 or 8 o'clock, come home, eat dinner, put the kids to bed, and then go back to work or work from home until 2 or 3 in the morning, and I was like the dad zombie. He would call and say, I'm on my way home, and then it would be 2 or 3 hours, and, you know, the romantic dinner candles had burned down, and I was thinking he was dead by the side of the road. So, you know, if 24 hours goes by and I don't hear from him, I pretty much know where to find him. I live in Michigan. And I commute. So it's quite a long commute. I don't make it every day. I only make it about every two weeks or so. But um, you know, there's quite a time change. Here it's something like 12.01 in the morning, and there it's 1954. The motivation for moving back here is I wanted to get into a community, put roots down, and, and you know, feel settled. And uh, life is just different out there. It, it really is. I mean, here people like work at a car factory or whatever, and they're 30 years and out. If you want to go over there, sure, that's fine by me. We spent like 45 minutes talking about all his, like his whole story from job to job to job to job. And I thought it was pretty cool. He yeah, had like over, bro, I mean, I don't know, it was like over like 10 or something jobs. He seemed to do it a lot during particularly peak uh, stressful times, like, you know, baby due in two months, I'm changing jobs now, dear. I like when everything's changing. 
That makes it exciting. That's why I do it. It's something to be in the storm, in the, in the, right in the middle of it, and seeing everything new happening and putting it all together. It's really exciting. It's almost addictive. I, I wouldn't want to leave it, that's for sure. At times, it's a clear sacrifice of elements of your personal life. I have to work very hard, but I have the chance of being rewarded for my efforts. The disadvantage, my life's moving on. I don't have any children yet. You realize there's a certain amount of my life that I'm sacrificing, and I'm going to look back, and a portion of this life is gone. In the U.S., we have at least several million people directly making a living from, from software. And it's the fastest growing group of people in the economy. And it's certainly, in aggregate, the highest paying field of its size. I mean, yeah, you've got baseball, you've got Hollywood. But, you know, when you really think of a group that has millions of people in it, these are the highest wages anybody's ever seen in the United States. I hear you. The opportunity to, to win big uh, uh, for code writers is, is very real. In fact, uh, that, um, if you will, jackpot uh, opportunity is reflected here on a Wall Street trading desk. And I find that a lot of the uh, engineers and, and managers from Silicon Valley are very attuned to what goes on on these trading floors um, daily. By one account, 64 millionaires are created daily in Silicon Valley, where any technology worker can strike it rich overnight. You join a company and they give you some stock options, which basically says, rather than just giving you stock, they give you the right to buy the stock in the future at the current price. You might get stock uh, in the order of, you know, maybe a year's salary or two years' salary, typically worth of options. In some of these real booming companies uh, out there on the internet, the potential for becoming a millionaire or doing very well is very, very high. The people who are very, very early, you know, they call them mozillionaires. Stock options are a con. Um, it's, it's, it's a carrot they dangle. It's like, oh, well, you know, if you, if you give up your one and only youth, maybe someday you'll make money, right? Uh, it's, um, I've known so many people who, who, who gambled on the startup lottery and got nothing. You know, it's, it's, it's just like a lottery ticket. It's a stupid tax. Um, I happen to win that particular lottery. From the day Microsoft announced its aggressive commitment to the Internet, however, Netscape's stock has been in a steady decline, and throughout most of 1998, Netscape options are essentially worthless. A year and a half ago, half of our revenue came from browser sales. Today, none of it does. And well, any business person out there knows that that's a huge challenge. I mean, let me take your number one selling product away from you and you replace that within a period of 12 months or so. Not many people want to do that. Even though the company sells other Internet products, the marketplace views Netscape as a browser company in a losing battle with Microsoft. Greg, this is John Barksdale with Netscape Communications. How are you? It's clear that Netscape doesn't have enough pieces to threaten Microsoft. All right, Greg. Have I don't think day. that Netscape long term can survive as an independent company. <laughs> While Mozilla tries to recapture the early glory days of the company, integrating code from the outside means more work for everyone on the browser team. Apparently, I must have done it backwards from what you told me, or I don't know what. Okay, this is bad. And we want to take the old free tree and use it as a subsection, and we want to build this interesting tree around no, it. No, that's not what we want to do. We have NS and NSPriv at the top, right? It's either a project file for this or a project file for that. It can't be a project file for both. We don't have a plan for doing both. So right now, I have some files that have to come from here for Java in the single directory, and some files that have to come from here in the same directory, the same directory. Tell me how I do that. That's the problem. The browser division, which costs the company almost $30 million a year to operate and contributes few revenues to the company, is reorganized in the fall for the second time in less than a year. Do we, know, do we have all the answers? No. We're going to try and learn what we can from seeing the people who've done this well. When I joined a startup, I knew that 19 out of 20 fail. When an employee comes to work at Netscape today, he doesn't have the perception that there's a 19 out of 20 chance that this job is not going to be in place one to five years from now. If you live here, it is the ubiquitous conversation. 
do you believe that Microsoft has used either a illegal or just unfair methods to take market share from Netscape? And if the heart and soul of this industry is opportunity, is egalitarianism, Microsoft having achieved its market share on anything other than the backs of its code um, really riles everybody up. Justice Department has charged Microsoft with engaging in anti-competitive and exclusionary practices designed to maintain its monopoly in personal computer operating systems and attempting to extend that monopoly to internet browser software. Regardless of its case against Microsoft, Netscape has become a victim of its increasing size and the growing complexities of its code. The company struggles to maintain the vitality it enjoyed as a startup. When a company gets to be above a certain size, it's just a process. It's, it's a, a mechanism for making money, and innovation is like one possible way of doing that, but it's a risky way, so company, big companies don't do that. Um, Microsoft actually doesn't do very much. They buy companies. They wait until someone has done something interesting, and then they acquire them, and then they milk it for all it's worth. And, I mean, I don't mean to pick on Microsoft, because lots of companies do that. It's just a normal way of doing business. We're on our way over to the Flint Center now. Uh, we're going to have an all-hands meeting. Jim Barksdale has moved up the all-hands meeting by roughly about a week. We've just announced quarterly results, and now this major change in direction. Well, in case you hadn't read the newspapers, <laughs> uh, we have, uh, as of 1.30 this morning, uh, concluded uh, negotiations and agreed to sell our company to AOL of Dulles, uh, Virginia. I can't imagine that day when they announced the merger that they weren't like, oh, I don't believe this. You know, sort of what is sort of a nightmare scenario. Although, you know, the worst one would have been Microsoft buying us, I guess. <laughs> you know, then they would have. You know, you'd have seen like this this flow of cars out of Netscape. Six months ago, they were insulting AOL's technology. You know, it was a service for idiots. Congratulations, Skippy. You've got mail. Netscape was not unusual in the way they felt about AOL in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's very clear that nobody had any respect for the company. One of them at the Netscape called uh, Steve Case a soap salesman because he used to work at Procter & Gamble. The soap salesman bought them. The quote that came out of this article was uh, Netscape, uh, something along the lines of, live fast, died young, and left a tired corpse. And uh, I don't know that I agree with that. Uh, I don't think Netscape's done yet. They bought us because they like us. They like what we do. And they don't want to disturb that formula. So their plan is to not damage us in any way. There had been a lot of... Uh a lot of speculation out on the net, you know, in the free software community, like, oh, well, this is it, you know, it's all over now, AOL's just gonna screw everything up. So I wrote this thing that I put on the Mozilla.org site that laid out the worst case scenario, like, well, okay, even if everything goes wrong, it's still not as bad as you're saying it is, because the, the nature of what Netscape did meant that the code belongs to the community now. A few days later, I got email from Steve Case saying, we think what you're doing is a great thing, and it's part of the reason we bought the company, and we plan to keep it going that way. So um, as far as Mozilla.org and Netscape and AOL's contribution to the open source movement goes, he says it's going to continue. The merger with AOL creates a windfall for shareholders that will give Netscape employees the chance to cash out and move on, causing speculation in the national media about AOL's ability to retain Netscape's key people. And already I hear, you know, that the AOL people have come in at Netscape and said, you know, this is the AOL way. Well, it's not going to work at Netscape. It's got to be the Netscape way with help from AOL. I suspect some of them will leave. You know, they don't want to be part of AOL. Some people just like the startup mentality, and those that want to uh, sort of be part of a juggernaut are going to stay and be part of the juggernaut. I've been at Netscape for three and a half years, and it feels like forever. Um, AOL's focus and Netscape's growing focus has been marketing and advertising and all that stuff, and that's not nearly as interesting to someone who's sort of a techno-fetishist. Uh, you know, I'm switching jobs, I'm selling my house, I'm moving, switching towns. Uh, 
that's life for for uh, for startup land. I'm still young and stupid, as I like to put it, so I can get away with doing stuff like that. Year and a half ago, so Tara comes to me. She says, I want to be a manager so bad that I can taste it. <laughs> so we finally said, all right, you get to be a manager. And like within a week, she said, why did you ever let me do this? <laughs> <laughs> and Tara's turned out to be like one of the Netscape's greatest managers. So here's to Tara, the release team manager. Tara leaves Netscape for an e-commerce startup, missing out on a big jump in the value of her stock options in hopes of a bigger payout at her new company. Free Mozilla! Free yes, Mozilla! Free the source! <laughs> Regardless of how AOL runs the Netscape business, it's not Netscape anymore. That part's over. And, you know, that's really sad. I, I wish Netscape could have gone it on their own. Frustrated by what he perceives as a lack of commitment to open source development, Jamie quits Netscape one year to the day he helped give away Mozilla. The movie Hackers, I think, is just a great movie. Um, I, I wish our lives were like that. I wish we were roller skating around in spandex and, and fighting bad guys. But, you know, it's, it, it's not. It's, it's sitting in a room and typing all day. This was what I was trying to escape, this, this life. I knew I did not want to live here. I've been out here now about four or five years. This is a nice place. This is, this is escape from the jungle. Jim Roskind is promoted to Netscape's highest engineering rank. Last night I was here at four in the morning, and this isn't even in the middle of a critical push, but it's almost like an addiction, an adrenaline rush, a going for perfection, a pushing. And then, as you see the results, you get the feedback to push harder. You know, I, I really shouldn't comment on this since I'm just as foolish as everyone else, but I'll just go ahead and do it while admitting that I'm foolish. There's just a tremendous quest for material wealth here. It's like the gold rush all over again. And this is going to be the, the playhouse. And then this will be like a front porch with maybe little flowers and stuff. So it'll be like a cute little house. I went to Netscape because its main purpose was to generate cash based on this, this internet thing. That's like, what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to get rich. It just took a heavy toll on our marriage. And if it wasn't for God's grace, we wouldn't have made it. Why would I use God's gifts? Michael burned out. Michael came to a place where he, where in his own life where he said, the cost is too great, I'm not going to do it anymore. If people would look at this and say, oh, hey, this, this is a cool thing, I'm going to start a startup and get rich quick, you know, I would just have to say, you need to count the cost because you can't ever retrieve the time that's lost. Michael Toy, Netscape employee number six, achieved his goal of financial independence and retired from Netscape shortly after Mozilla's release. In the Valley, if you've stayed someplace longer than about three years, people wonder what's going on. Why can't you get another job? What's wrong with you? Uh, if you're a programmer, you pretty much change jobs about every two years or so. It's like ants, worker ants. They send a group out to do something. As that group approaches the task that they're going to do, some ants leave, more ants come on. Uh, by the time it gets to the target, it could be a totally different set of ants. I think as we distribute the set of work that we're doing and more and more in the information age, it'll be more like that. Scott Collins continues to commute to Netscape from Michigan. There's a lot of pressure right now to complete our product on time. Uh, sort of weighed in with the ridiculous acrobatics the stock is doing. We were a $20 company. At, as of this moment, our stock is like $172. So it's hard to be depressed about the amount of work you have to do when every other cube holds a millionaire. When the deal with AOL closes in the spring of 1999, the value of Netscape's stock more than doubles since the merger's announcement. Netscape married right. Uh, they, they hitched their fortunes to AOL. When the transaction was announced, uh, the implied valuation was about $4.2 billion. 
when the transaction was completed, the transaction was valued at $10 billion. So in effect, about five and a half or six billion dollars of net worth was created. So I think it was the very clever deal making of Netscape management that kept them in the game uh, much longer and Netscape shareholders benefited quite considerably. While many executives sold their stock during Netscape's final year, Barksdale bought more. And after the merger, he swapped his shares for more than a half a billion dollars of AOL stock. Another young man comes west to seek his fortune on technology's new frontier. I was a little bit nervous going into uh, this interview, because um, I'm not entirely sure what to expect. It's a long way away, 3,000 miles. So long way for your child to be, but uh, this is a place where there's a lot going on that, that he's very interested in and I think has some talents in this area. And uh, I really think that may, this may be a kind of home for him uh, as far as being able to work with people that uh, he can actually talk to. Hey, see you again. This is Eve. What I want to know is what you want to do, I mean, what your goals are for the next couple of years. My, my goal right now is I want to see the Unix version faster than the Windows version. Once we pull that off, then, you know, we'll see, but that, that's my goal. Pavlov is hired by Netscape. He postpones going to college. Hey, Taking part in what one investor has called the largest legal creation of wealth in the history of the planet, David Retterman moves to a new investment bank. Here's the data center. A uh, lot, of, lot of cable, a lot of fiber. These can be sort of, you know, internet connections. They can be our trading lines, our phone lines. Uh, you know, we're laying the infrastructure to basically uh, build a, a major merchant bank. Our view is that the internet changes everything and we're going to uh, finance the companies that want to be the agents of that change. Look at this intersection. We've got, we've got a bank here. In two years, you know, this may not be here. Why not, why not bank online? GAP's website is, is one of the most successful commerce websites on the market. I don't even know why Gap's renovating this store. Why aren't they investing more in their website? I don't know what this intersection may look like two years from now. When I started, people didn't know what HTML was, what the World Wide Web was, and all of a sudden, the power of the internet that had been there for years was available to everybody in an easy way, point and click, the, the universal language. It's like uh, Fantasia when Mickey is standing over the, the book that's open on the mountain and he's looking in to see what to do and he does something. He doesn't really know what he does, but it makes something happen. And of course, that thing gets out of control and keeps going. You don't know why it works. You don't know how it works. You just push a button and it works. We're at the beginning of an industry and, and who knows where that industry is going to go. This could all turn into television again. It could be controlled by a small number of, 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 uh, of companies who, who decide what we see and hear. And there's a lot of precedent for that. I'm just laying down the tracks and there are these trains zooming by me and there's no way I'd want to say that it's a bad thing to have these trains fly by. It would be a horrible legacy if they ended up, ended up being the legacy of, of you know, Netscape and the internet. I, uh, the, you know, that we could all like do what we're doing on, only under much more intense pressure and much faster. Everything has to change faster, obviously. You know, look at Netscape. It was born and died. I don't want to use the word died, they wouldn't like that word, but it basically was born and overtaken within uh, four years. That's pretty fast, I think, because <laughs> they must think it's very fast. Near the end of 1999, the public still awaits Netscape's first open source browser, more than a year after Mozilla was released. The judge in the Justice Department's antitrust trial rules that Microsoft is a monopoly that stifles innovation. AOL begins the millennium with a new, even larger acquisition, 
and investors continue buying technology stocks, which trade with increasing volatility. Still, as the Internet finds its way into every corner of daily life, so too will legions of programmers and their code, working fast and late into the night.